Welcome to Positive Moments with Andrew and Dot. Let everything go. That was such a life-changing experience. It's a way of life, it's a way of being, it's a way of thinking, it's mind management. It inspires me to know that there's more to learn every single day. Welcome back to Positive Moments with Andrew and Don. Every episode is special, but today has something particularly special about it. If you look on my left, you would see dressed in red, white, and black. Normally he's the, I would say, host or co-host with me. But guess what? Today we're just talking with Andrew Lewis, the athlete. And let me tell you, everybody, the longest journey begins with a step. We look at people and we wonder, how did they arrive there? How did, he, how did they get to the Olympics? But let me tell you, that journey started a long time ago. And Andrew, long time I haven't said this, welcome to Positive Moments with Andrew, <laughs> <laughs> with Andrew and Dad. But Andrew, people don't really know your story. You know, they see the glory, but they don't know the story. And we want to delve in a little bit for this episode number 10. We want to delve in a little bit to Andrew Lewis, how you end up here. <laughs> yes, yes, you know... Um... The, the journey began of being around a family of sea lovers, you know, um, grandfather, parents. The ocean was the place I felt like we went to when there was any free time, whether it was the kids not in school or the parents not working. It was beaches down the islands. Um, and there is a bit of a, uh, a sailing background in my family. My grandfather became a sailor. Uh, a recreational sailor, and by nature, my father um, also became a bit of a um, weekend racer and developed this program down in Chagaramas, which I would have been uh, a part of the summer camps. And um, the truth is, I was a, a real pest. I used to give my coaches and my teachers a hard time, but I had a great time, great, great time. And my youth was very, very fulfilled with being around these ocean-oriented sports. But sailing wasn't my true love at that, that stage of my life. Huh? Um, I was a, a, a big lover of, of football. And uh, people like your brother Dion would have been one of my coaches. And, you know, the, the ability to realize that sport was my home was a very, very important recognition of my life. And I would say that may have come to life even before I was 10 years old. I knew that sport was home. Wow. I think if I went to coaching with Dion, Dion would have recommended me for sailing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> leave the football alone. But Andrew, at that point in time in Trinidad and Tobago, because sailing, to, to go all the way with sailing, I mean, yes, you, you have to love the sport and so on. People, you know, the, the, okay, certain people sail. But Andrew, for you to, to, to later on, years after, put on the red, white, and black for sailing. I mean, it didn't just, it didn't just happen. So after you, you went to the camps, you enjoyed it, and so what was the next step? Because something had to propel you to say, I could take this world class. And maybe, maybe it's a conversation with a friend or two that could tell you, Andrew, what are you, what are you sailing for? So um, at home, one uh, in 2004, um, while the... Athens Olympics was going on. Um, we had a coach, a Peruvian coach, who was working with me. And we were trying to watch the Olympics in those days, which is very challenging, especially in the sport of sailing. But sailing being something that I was super fascinated by um, from even on my eighth or ninth birthday, getting a little sailboat to um, come to my home and waking up to that, I was just hooked, hooked sailing. But when we were watching that Olympic Games, and uh, we saw the Brazilian, um, who was still competing against me, um, Robert Scheid, win the Olympic medal, um, he said, you know, you could do that too. You, you could go to the Olympics too. So those words, you could do that too, what I did to you? Everything that I needed, just for him saying that, um, and seeing that whatever he saw in me, and then instilling that into uh, him, instilling that into my father, and then that becoming something that my mother and father supported um, was all it took. And I believe around me they had the opposite happening. 
because they had a lot of talent on the island coming alive, even some of which were getting... Um, I was national champion many, many times. But there was a young boy uh, who was coming up and eventually became a um, youth uh, silver medalist, which I had, I had never achieved at that point in my career. So in theory, he was beating records than I had done. Uh, it was always seen, the sport was always seen as it's too expensive and it's too hard and it's not possible to achieve from our island. And it's still like that. There's a big stigma around it. And that goes for many, many sports. Um, people don't realize, but it, the similar costs that are associated with sailing are the same in cycling. Um, and are the same in the, the cost of my boat. Maybe even archery as well, too. Maybe even archery and shooting. But the, the cost in my boat is the same as a pair of professional golf clubs or a, a, a good cycling, a good bike in a prof for a professional. So you have these aspects that are it's not, it's seen as a very prestigious sport and the cost is very high. But yet we have a lot of Olympic cyclists, um, no golfers as yet. But to me, more importantly, is that belief system that was instilled in me at a, a young, young, young age, where there was no, but you can't do that. But the ones who said you can't do that was the ones who were making noise. These were not the ones who I believed in, who were my true leaders. My true leaders, they instilled what was needed. And from that point in time, we were, we were creating a pathway together because it didn't exist. Still doesn't exist in, set, in, a th in theory. But that pathway, because there's so many different roads that you could go on. What was the road to say, maybe there's a big games I'm going to try to qualify for, and let me just use that. What was the big game back then? What was it, 20, 2008, 2012? What, 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 what? So that was when um, I was still in, in, in secondary school, high school, and we were, we were getting very ambitious. And we saying, well, maybe we could qualify for the 2008 Olympic Games, which would be Beijing. And I was, in the process of that, I was around 16, 17, 18 years old. In those three years of, of, of acknowledging that we could try this as the first Olympic Games, then we could um, do the whole process to get there. And we did. We, we had a, I had a coach, a fitness trainer. Um, I was still in school at that point in time, training, training. It was just trying to figure it out. It was a, it was a lot of... Um, a lot of trial and error, a lot, a lot, from coaches to, to fitness trainers to, to figure out how to raise money. It was, it seemed to me as every day was just a challenge, but I just said, the goal stays the same. The goal stays the same. The goal stays the same. Uh, and the goal was to go to Australia in January 20, 2008, because um, that was where the qualifications were. Um, and that would have been my first time going to Australia. And I arrived, uh, I went from Port of Spain um, to Miami, Miami to Houston, Texas, and then Houston, Texas to Sydney, Australia. And I was so young and so uh, excited, but I, I was very um, inexperienced to the point where I was sitting down in the airport in Texas in the wrong terminal, missed my flight. You know, sitting down here waiting for everyone to come and no one's coming for the flight. The flight getting close, I get there. Uh, all of a sudden, a lady walks by and says, well, what flight do you want? I say, waiting for the flight. Maybe it's delayed. Well, that flight left already. So I had to get put on another flight and learn these things early o'clock. I was, I was around 17 years old. And I'm glad that my parents trusted in me to handle my stories, I should say, to fly around the world, fly across the world at that age with this big dream of mine. So we went to Australia, we fought, we, we gave it all, of, all we had, um, but we didn't qualify. Um, and finishing there was very heartbreaking. As a teenager, I feel like you're a very fragile, breakable person. Because, you know, as a teenager, you're, I, and you're, I always hear it, you know, teenagers come in, and a, a young one saying, well, I want to be astronaut, doctor. And little by little, you find their dreams being broken whether it's by people or whether it's by their bad decisions or whatever it is, you see these dreams falling apart little by little. And I saw that dream fall apart. I was so confident I was going to qualify. I was so confident the work I had done was going to be enough, um, but it wasn't. So that was Australia. And Australia, as we know, is called Down Under. 
But let me tell you, down and under. You were down, but you were not really under because you had to look up. Because I know at that point in time, I mean, you're a teenager, you're in the prime teen years, you know, you're, you're, you're gonna, gonna be an adult, really, after that. But Andrew, you've always been an optimistic person. From the time I've known you, I mean, I, I can say I've known you as an optimistic person. And we're in the red, white, and black, and now we're called Team TTO. But you know, I have to do a little word, something. I can't just leave TTO just like that. And, and for TTO for me is, I say the Tokyo outlook. But even before we get to TTO, there is the, the 2008, you're not down, and down under, but you're not down and out, right? And you decide after that experience, you're going for it again. And again, I imagine you had certain people saying, Andrew, yes, you can do it. And others saying, Andrew, come on. I mean, who, who, was there a role model, even in Trinidad and Tobago, who made it in sailing so far? Or you were the first to say, Olympic qualifier kind of thing. Now, was there anybody else who walked apart? The um, there was some, there were, you know, Jean-Marc Holder and, and those guys who were doing Olympics and Pan Am Games, CSE Games. But these are in the 60s and, and, and way, way before my time. They were, they're not even in Trinidad for me to discuss or, or have them as mentors. And in those days, it was a way different program. It wasn't about qualifying for the Olympic Games. It was about just Trinidad and Tobago is associated with the IOC. Anyone can go. And if there was going to be a trial, it's an internal trial to see who goes from Trinidad. It's like Trinidad an automatic qualifying spot. So someone gets to go. Whereas from here, I have to qualify the nation, and then the nation has to accept me as their athlete. Um, so by going to Australia was go the goal of, of qualifying the nation, like I do every single Olympic Games. Um, but I didn't do that. And, and I was down and out. I, was, I felt like I was down under. And it was a message to me that, you see this sailing thing? Um, get rid of that. That's, that's expensive. Um, everyone else is getting degrees in university. Um, they're going to go and work in a family business, or they're going to go and become an entrepreneur, or go and find a job somewhere. It's time for you to follow the, the pack and go. Um, and, and, and I had a, a great relationship with uh, the team at UTT, the sports program. Um, and where they brought me in as the pioneer for the sailing. Because um, that is the swimming program, the volleyball program, the netball program, the football program, cricket program. But they said, we'll bring one sailor, he'll live with the athletes down in Omera, he'll study sports studies, and he has a dream of going to Olympic Games, and we'll try and help him uh, get access to some facilities and some things. So I went, I, I said, you know what, uh, I'm going to go to school and follow the sports program, and... But I, I think I'm done sailing. So I got into school and I started to finish this program and do it. And it's never been more evident to me that when you're in the wrong place, you just know. But I knew that education is fundamental for one's success. So I completed the program. I did it one year, the sports study certificate came out of there with my certificate. But I knew while going through that process that this is not the right place for me. So that program was important for me to experience, for me to tell me, get back to training, you have an Alexa Olympics to try for. Because coming out of Australia, I was done. Wow. Well, I just want to touch on something that you said there. So education is necessary. And you know, well, I'm just going to do this one for you. I'm going backwards. E-D-C-B-A. Education, right, definitely comes before achievement. So you were spending time to get some, to achieve some stuff, and maybe you see yourself just as a coach down the road. Okay, maybe I, I learned enough in this here. I did enough camps. I love, I'm, I, I tr you know, trouble my coaches so much. I could now be a, a great coach. So maybe if you stay at UTT and you just work that, but somewhere along the line, you pick back up and you said, hey, what, I didn't make it in Australia, but there's an Olympic Games in London, and London has to become a reality again. How did that, how did that switch go? It's, it's, the, the, switch, the switch was in my heart. It's a gut feeling. Um, and I really believe it's important for us as human beings to follow our gut. Um, the same reason if you feel hungry, you will try to find food and eat. Your gut is telling you the sense of direction as true as your heart, a.k.a. your passion and purpose. So I realized my passion and purpose was the sport of sailing, um, regardless of all the noise, because noise is always going to be there. Don't do that. 
go and do the sport, eat this, don't eat this, study that, don't study that. It's just everyone has an opinion and a sense of direction. But my gut is the, is the one that told me where to go. So, got back on the train. We got same coach, but everything else changed around the team. New fitness trainer, new nutritionist, um, new plan, much more uh, fundraising. Um, when I took, a, I, I even went to the extent to realize that the fundraising we did before that Olympic campaign for 2008 was not enough. Um, and I took a very, very uh, hard approach that I was going to get a bank loan. This is, I, I've never heard anyone do anything like this before. Get a bank loan, get a guarantor to try and qualify for the Olympic Games. Because the vision I had needed funding. And the funding I knew would be paid back if I qualified. Because I'd research this whole thing. By this time, I'm now sitting with almost every top athlete possible in Trinidad and Tobago and around the world education. to educate education. myself on the Olympic education. Games. How much it costs, how much sponsors pay you, how you get sponsors, where you get this, where you get that. Talking to aunties, talking to uncles, talking to everybody possible to get the necessary information to educate myself, to achieve this. And the whole team came together and, and all of a sudden the results just started going up, 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 up. But I, I always had this pressure on my back of a bank loan that I had promised the guarantor that if I qualified, I'll pay it back because of the resources I would achieve. If I didn't qualify, the job I got in the time to come, I'll pay it off eventually. But that was my commitment to them. So with that whole experience happening, I started to achieve results um, very consistently that said, Andrew, if you continue like this, you're going to qualify for London. But still people didn't believe me. I still showed them, look, look, look at the results I'm producing. With this, I, if, I, if I did the same thing, come on, if it qualifies, I'm in. And I did it once, I did it twice. But for some reason, people thought that with the pressure of the Olympic qualifiers or these kind of things, it wouldn't happen, it wouldn't be achieved. Um, so we went off to Germany in this very, very remote place called Boltenhagen. And the Olympic trials were there. And I was with myself, my Peruvian coach, another Peruvian athlete, and another Peruvian coach. And we were a little team, a little unit, hoping that both of these athletes would qualify. And freezing cold, tough, tough conditions. And I said, no matter what happens here, you finish with, you leave everything on the line. Everything on the line. And race by race, the whole competition, first day I was in qualification, second, every day, all the way to the end, I was in qualification. I qualified for the Olympic Games. What was that like? Your first Olympic Games, you qualified? You didn't make I, it in 2008? So when I finished the, um, when I crossed the finish line in the last race, and my coach had told me, you qualified. I didn't believe him yet. It was very unbelievable. Because with sailing, you have things that could be changed. They could have a situation where um, a race could be, you could be disqualified for the start line, and they have a review period. I was up the understanding. I said, you know what? Let me see the results myself and we get back to show. But I felt in my heart that wow, this dream has come true. I remember going back to, to show and just making a sign across, saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And just, I couldn't wait. I just arrived back to show, put my board down, I went straight to the results board and counted da -da -da -da, inside, counted again, da -da -da, inside, uh, over and over to make sure that there was no mistakes. And it just started to come alive. But it was, it was so hard to believe in that moment, and it was so euphoric at the same time, that I had to ha go through a process of really believing it happened. Because it was, I had, I had nothing left. I had no money in the bank. I put everything to that event. Everything. Every piece of energy, every resource, every dollar. Um, I stressed everything around me to make this happen. And when I realized we qualified, being ecstatic and so passionate, I needed time for myself. So I went home that day and laid on the grass outside in Germany and just looked up to the sky. At that point in time, it was, the sun was setting late, so it's maybe 9 o'clock at night, it's still setting. And just reflected, and it was about three hours of thinking about the challenges in school, the challenges of dyslexia, the challenges of Beijing, the challenges of no money, 
the challenges of everything. And I just knew from that day on, everything will be okay. Wow. Everything that happened to me from that day on. And that was way down okay. the road too. Not just not just for the immediate Olympic Games, but beyond the Olympic Games as well too. Way beyond, way beyond. So you 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 came back and I mean your peers are now saying Andrew, the same somebody the the, the noise saying, Hey, well, you know, well done and we're so happy for you. You're getting to wear the red, white, and black. And just take us very quickly into those first games in London. What was that like? Because London, I imagine, the, the new atmosphere. I mean, you would have traveled through London before, but now I'm here for an Olympic Games. The atmosphere is different. I have new athletes. What was that like? Just give us a little synopsis of those games. It was... I know, I was just freaking out the whole time. You know, I was just kidding a candy store, flying around taking pictures with famous people, couldn't wait to see my board brand, the TTO with my same name, Lewis, on it. Um, I was just freaking out having a great time. Um, and I couldn't believe what was really happening here. But at the same time, every time I got some more info, I was like, wow, you for you for I remember walking out in the Olympic Stadium and all you see is these flashing lights, flashing lights, flashing lights. You, can just, you, you can't see people and you can't believe Every flashing light is a person taking a picture. Wow. That's the amount of cameras in the stadium. And you can't see people because there's so many flashing lights. Not from the photography team, huh? In the entire of, of 80 something thousand people in the stadium. And to hear that sound, and I could imagine noise. the crowd and the... Yeah, and he walked out. I just got wow. goosebumps, goosebumps over and over. Any tears? For tears, for sure. Everything. I just knew walking through the Olympic Stadium, the opening ceremony, I was home. Olympic Games was for Andrew Lewis. This is where passion and purpose is not only going to be found, but evolve even more. How did you perform? How did you do in those Olympic Games? Because you had to come down for that euphoria of that opening ceremony and all that. How did you perform in those games? Uh, it was a challenging Olympic Games for me. But it was one of those where I, it result didn't matter. It was just to get, achieve the status of Olympics. And to, to, I came in there knowing the result in which I was performing. And I knew that, okay, this is the average of where I'll finish. Um, these, these conditions are very challenging. My first time, let me get some experience on my belt. And then we go again. And I watched the finals. I watched it and I said, you know, my, I, my heart felt for, for not being there. Um, I said to myself, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there in Rio. Wow, wow. And, and from that point, from that point, I could imagine... Past performance doesn't guarantee success. So you're going to go to Rio next. Mm -hmm. But guess what? It's no automatic qualification. The fact that you qualify for one Olympics before doesn't mean that you automatically qualify for another. It doesn't work that way. You still have to qualify. So then you have to, to go and do some things again. But I guess you're going to be a little wiser now. We'll talk about you, the regimen now because now you're an Olympian. So you could be a, either a one-time Olympian. You know, we have the One World Wonders. Or you could be a two-time Olympian. So now that you're heading to be a two-time Olympian, what was that preparation like? Um, and I remember something funny where a guy said to me, in the, in the London Olympic Games, there were 52 boats. And every Olympic Games has gotten harder and harder. And now they cut it back uh, to 42 boats for Rio. And the guy said to me, well, let's see him do it now, no? Let's see him do it now because, you know, he... He, he qualified in 49th, now let me, but let me see him qualify now with the only being 42. 42. So already they were doubting the, the possibilities of me qualifying. Um, but for me, qualifying was not a focus. It was meddling. Well, now I have the experience. Now let's build a massive team around me, even more sponsors. Um, and let's start to make money while doing this too. Because I want to make a life through this. I want to pay my bills, create a life around it, and want to have my own home, my own car, these kind of things. That was my focus. That don't just go and sail. Turn it into a business and make a life through sailing. Because a lot of athletes focus on their sport, a, a large amount of them. But when they finish their sport, all they have is their sport. I wanted to have a home, a car, maybe some savings, and be able to say, well, I made a life through sailing, not just went to the big games. Wow, you talk about some of them just have a sport, but what they need is support. And the bank, Republic Bank, would have come in, who are actually sponsoring this program, you know, to how things work out. 
who sponsors this program, they would have supported you very, very early and say, Andrew, we're believing in you in the future. And now to actually have the bank on board with you, not once, but twice now, other people coming on board and saying, Andrew, you can do it. But what is so interesting, Andrew, and knowing your story a bit, is that even then, getting ready for your second qualification, you were still thinking about others because there's a legacy after Andrew Lewis. The Andrew Lewis Sailing Foundation, I imagine. But you wanted others to learn the sport as well. And I, I know you've traveled around the country trying to bring that back. What was there at that point? Was that part of it or that, did that come way after the, the Vessini experience? When, when did that come in? <sighs> that's, that's with me since, since small. Um, I've always loved to help people because the natural effect of somebody telling you thank you or I appreciate that is another euphoric feeling to me. So it's like, I'm not trying to get people to say thank you, but I know if I do good deeds, it just comes out positively, it feels great. And when I was in my early teens, I would still already coach young boys and girls, and I was still in the youth classes. So I might be 14 or 15, but I'm still having 9, 10 year, 12 year olds, um, even going to competitions with them, still like trying to coach at such a young age. But it was not, something that I was able to do. Like, it was not possible for Andrew to be a 15-year-old now coming out of the youth classes and being their coach. I could help, but I wanted to be their coach, but it, they had their own coach already. So I had to wait my time, but I never stopped trying to help. So I would just continue, and as I started to grow and started to um, evolve, then I started to have my opportunity to, you know, through the, the guidance of with my father and, and to take sailing across Trinidad and Tobago, set up the Vestney program and then harness that under the Andrew Sailing program to give back, to give back. So it was in me since I was as far back as I can remember, just wanted a mentor and give back. You had to give back, but you certainly had to get back to the fact too that 2016. Yeah. Rio beckons and what, what was so so Rio tell me you know quick how does Rio because I'm, I'm excited to get to Tokyo eh? let me tell you one the Tokyo outlook but how did Rio evolve how, how was that what was that like for Rio in terms of qualifying was it easy to qualify now with 42 boats no I mean in every qualification you always have this um, feeling that's a little bit scary like um, oof, can I do this again so once we had you know the thought of the Rio qualifications on my mind um, I knew what I had to go and do. Um, yeah, it was a little bit, of course, they have this, I would say, a motivative fear. It's because such a, such a big goal for yourself and your country. It scares you, but it motivates you. Um, and I was set out to go and do the Pan American Games in, uh, in Canada, in Toronto, in 2015, was the way I qualified for my second Olympic Games. And uh, once again, I remember crossing that uh, finish line, making it also to the finals of the Pan American Games. You know, I, I have a great picture of me just looking up and going, you know, thanking the Almighty for the, the blessing of, of achieving that again. And once again, qualifying for another Olympic Games. And I, and I knew, I always know, once you qualify for Olympic Games, that pressure is off. And what comes to nice support. You get a lot more sponsors coming on board, a lot more government and Olympic Committee. And you have this this gap preparation that's like no other. So you can have more coaching, more, more facilities, more, more equipment. Um, and I knew I had that year um, or, or, or around a year to, to bring all that together to go and try and make a finals in the Olympic Games. But this, uh, this Pan American Games finished in August 2015. So we started going on to Brazil to train. Uh, went on to Brazil once, had a great training camp, then went on to Brazil for a second time to now train and start to race down there. And my goal is to go on to Brazil around five or six times before the Rio Olympic Games. I wanted to become like a local in the sailing. And um, we were down there and then all of a sudden, boom, the famous accident happened, which was just um, life-threatening, but it is what it is. You had to get up and go again. Get up and go again. And actually it's an interesting time for us to say, if you're interested in seeing Andrew's uh, fall, call it that, in Rio, um, and where he was able to rise from that. We have on Positive Moments with Andrew and Don. You can go to our YouTube. That's actually webinar number two. But we've been through that. The story is there for anybody wanting to look at it. 
So Rio happened, you, you, the, 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 the chance of you qualifying again in spite of, I mean, trust me, it's really an inspirational story that you need to go, go back and have a look at. But beyond Rio, so Rio happened, the placement, what was your placement like in Rio? I mean, just getting there to me was a medal, and I told him that just getting there was a medal already. To me, you're a medalist. You're a two-time Olympian, yes, but you're a medalist. The fact that you fell down is how many times we fall, is how many times we get up. We wonder that the times we, we get up more than the times that we fall. But two times now, you're Olympian. You thought, what, was hap what happened after that, 2016? What, what's, 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 what, where's, where's Andrew now in 2016, Rio? What's happening? Well, I finished uh, 39th out of 45 or 44 boats. And it was, um, it was an event where I just I barely made it back in time to compete. And it was one where I wanted it to be a purposeful event to show me, you know what, through hard work, through perseverance, you can achieve a goal. And while I didn't achieve the gold, which was the medal I wanted, I was able to recover and still compete while I was still really, really um, recovering, I should say. Um, but I was really blessed that, you know, they let me compete. I was able to be healthy enough to, to go out there and try. Um, because the, the truth was, if light wind came, um, I was a, a finalist contender. If the strong wind came, because I didn't have able to build back enough strength, it would be very challenging for me. And what did we have? The boss above sent strong, strong winds to test and really show that, you know, you could push through this and, and get stronger as a human being. So Rio happened, um, didn't have the, the best finish that I had dreamed about. But a, a dream of mine came alive just by being alive wow. to race in Rio. Wow, wow. That must have been really, really special. Back then, momentum is building. Because, okay, we didn't make it in 2008. 2012, we qualify, we dare. 2016, we dare in spite of the hiccup. But guess what? The momentum is building. So after 2016, the games recorded to be 2020 in Tokyo. How quickly did you get a Tokyo in your vision and say, I am going for Tokyo. There's going to be all, whichever team members are going to be there. I'm looking forward to wearing the red, white, and black, to which I'm now accustomed. You know what I mean? I'm an Olympic athlete. Tell us about Tokyo, because Tokyo had its own dynamics too. Tokyo didn't happen. It was supposed to happen. It still happened, but I don't know. What happened in Tokyo? So uh, coming out of Rio, the doctors um, said, you know, try and take around eight to ten months off of high performance training and, and racing. Your body needs to heal. So this was a long time um, to take off, but I did it. I enjoyed that time off. It was, it was time that I, I never really get to have with family, friends, um, doing a lot of work with the foundation, um, and, and, and then checking in with the doctors to see where's the healing at. Um, but deep down inside, Tokyo was, you know, we're going for this because I didn't get a chance to make it to the finals. And that was a dream in, in Rio. So I got back on the train uh, after taking that. I took almost a full year off to recover and rest. Um, and things had changed in the sport a little bit. One, the qualification became even harder again. Now only 34 boats qualify for the Olympic Games. The first Olympic Games had 50. Now 34. Um, so once again, I said, oh my gosh, this thing has got even harder again. Um, phew, let's go and try and do this. But as I got back in the boat and started to achieve certain things, the results were showing that, you know, um, I can do this. Um, during the process, I won the first ever um, World Cup medal for the country. Uh, it was actually the first of the Caribbean. Um, so that, to me, was a great confidence builder. Uh, like I got a new coach, Javier Hernandez from Spain, great, great guy. And Tokyo was looking bright, you know. I, I had great sponsor support. Um, Republic Bank was continuously there with me, and we were saying, you know, cool, go into the finals in Tokyo, and if the points are good and you're in line, who knows, a medal can happen. And the qualifications was going to be in Miami 2020. Um, so we went out there, and I remember calling you to get some confidence, um, because I needed a little bit of confidence. Um, I was, it was the hardest one ever, and I had a little bit of fear around the accident and what it had done to me. But the results were telling me that, Andrew, you can do this. 
But mentally, there were a lot of things happening that were just challenging. So having the right team around me, which is very important, like yourself, to say, you know, Andrew, you can do this and, and look at this and feel that and, and explore this and explore that. We went out to Miami. Uh, we had a big, big challenge ahead of us with a lot of Canadian athletes, a lot of Caribbean athletes fighting for this one spot. Um, and I was able to achieve it. That, for me, was one of my sweetest qualifications ever because I felt like while being one of the hardest qualifications ever, country quota-wise, um, it was coming out of the accident and all the different things that came with it that really was fulfilling. And then as normal, once we qualify, we bring all the resources together and we're, okay, cool. We're going to put everything possible to, to peak at the Olympic Games. And at that point in time, I took a little breather for a couple of weeks and then back on the train we went. And then all of a sudden, postponement of the 2020 Olympic Games. Hello, COVID-19. And you know, that's, that's kind of like a high and low because I still remember when you called me. I mean, there's a kind of iconic picture with you again when you're just doing like, and you hit the boat and so, I mean, it's all in the news and so, Andrew Lewis has qualified again. Yeah, then I, to go, I called you. Yeah, you, you, you in a wedding. In a wedding, yeah. And I tell you, know, I had to, I was emceeing the wedding. Yes, <laughs> Just yeah. remember my name of Sead Bash. You might hear yeah. my wrong positive moments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And, um, and then just to see your celebration, Andrew, I mean, it was so, I mean, I was getting chills. My, my, everything was, really, I was just like, oh gosh, it's so, so, so special. You all, Andrew, I, I went back in the wedding and I was, guess what? I just want to pause for a course, not just because I want to say Andrew Lewis has qualified yet again for another Olympics and people, ah, you know, it's a special to me. But Andrew, you had to wait now with COVID and then you had to wait, okay, was it with the games? Because at one point, they said you should cancel the game. People in Japan say, we don't want the games, right? And then people say, no, we should have the games. And then a whole to and fro. And then to say eventually, I remember asking you, Andrew, give me the lens side. Are the games on or are the games off? But I could imagine your emotions on and off. Because you have to train, you have to peak, you have to, you know what I mean? On and off, on and off. What was, what was that like? And then, and then it happened. What, what, what was that like? To use a word that I, I agree with you very strongly around my personality, which is uh, associated with, um, you know, I, I, I dream big and I believe big and I go big. Uh, I'm very ambitious in my dreams. And with the pandemic happening at the start of it, I was like, ah, this is going to pass a week or two, a month, etc. But as the pandemic really heightened and the lockdown started to take place, for the first time in my life, I found myself having strong doubts. Um, people calling, sponsors dropping out um, and saying, you know, with the pandemic, the world is at a stop. This is the first time anything happening. The Olympics probably not going to happen. Um, so one day I would be like, you know what, I train hard. We continue going real good. And then all of a sudden you get stuck in Spain and then the Spanish government says, you can't leave your house for six weeks unless you're going to the grocery or pharmacy. And to think of, you know, wow, we look out your window and it's just army, police. Um, it is, you're getting in trouble for the, for the basic things, you know, arriving to the grocery with your roommate. And the policeman comes and says, well, you're talking in the grocery? Yeah, we live together. You're living in the same house and both are in the grocery? That's illegal, you know. One person per household in the grocery, what are you doing here? You want to get arrested here today? What? Why don't you go home now? And we're like, what? In the grocery here? Yeah. So these are the kind of things that brought strong doubts to like, what's happening here? Can Olympic Games really happen? But these moments for me would, would be very short. Um, maybe a couple hours or a day or two. And then boom, back on the train, Olympic Games, Olympic Games. But the truth about me is everything I'm doing is I'm trying to become a healthier human being. Uh, I mean healthier by being more educated, um, fitter and stronger, um, more loving, um, having a, a stronger impact on this planet in a, in a positive way. And this show was born while stuck in Spain. You know, we had a conversation and we said, let's do something. So while I would be training um, at a certain time in the day, we would find an hour every night or an hour a couple of times a week to host Positive Moments in Andrew on season one. And that is how I saw the pandemic. Train as if it's happening, but don't lose the opportunity to help other people. Ooh, I, I, oh, that's powerful, Andrew. Train as if it's happening, 
but people are always happening. So people need to, to, to know that they can be positive. People need to know that, they, that there's still hope. And that's what it's all about. And, you know, you, you got to, to, to the games. is on 2021, you know. People still confuse her. Is it Olympics 2020 or 2021? You know what I mean? But, Andrew, interestingly, our team, I think the, the, the public was expecting quite a bit from us. You know, and I want to get specifically to the Tokyo outlook. They were expecting a lot from us. Maybe a medal here in this sport. Maybe a medal in this sport. We didn't medal, but I still believe they. I still believe, and I don't know if you know, agree with me that there were positives out of Tokyo. And that's why I mean this. This particular episode number ten, second season is called the Tokyo Outlook. There are some positives that came out. What was the experience like? Because looking at television, I just found those people look so friendly. It just looked like, whoa, a wonderful experience. Tell me about the outlook. So Tokyo was a very, um, uh, had a lot of stress around it. To, you know, with the whole pandemic, um, they thought that, you know, some people were, they were pushing the vaccines a lot um, and there was discomforts around there. They were also um, pushing the point where they were saying, uh, you have to get these PCR tests before you go. Um, a lot of unfamiliar territories were happening um, in order to arrive here because they were trying to make this thing the safest possible ever Olympic Games in the middle of a pandemic, especially. So while we had all these, you know, discomforts happening of, of go left or go right or how to go this, how to do that, or the thought in the back of your mind that you have to test PCR tests every single day. And if you test positive, whether it's before uh, or during, you're out, you know? Um, and and, and th these, these are very unusual things that you would never feel. So there are new dynamics were coming. So, but the Japanese people were extremely professional. Um, I like to call the Japanese measure twice, cut once people. You know, you'll arrive there and they'll check everything twice to make sure you did it right. Um, they were very, very polite, very clean, very homey. Um, a person in another culture might tell you, no, don't do that. Um, but the same exact no, very strong. They would say, sir, sorry, 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 sir, sorry, no, sir, sorry, sorry, in the most polite way. And I even saw one guy shouting at a Japanese lady, very furious and angry. And she was smiling, sorry, sir, sorry, sorry, sorry. To try that, sorry, 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 sorry. And sorry. That's, what, that's what her response. But it was a no is no. Let me try, no. Andrew, let me try. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No. That was a no. I was a no. So their way of operating was very kind, very professional, very clean. And we had a, I had a great uh, 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 preparation for the start of racing. Um, the setup and the organization, really, really well done. And my confidence was high. You know, I had been performing well. I'd been training really hard. And I knew that there were going to be a lot of external pressures around this Olympic Games, being it so different, no spectators. But I myself... Um, was going to try and have the best experience possible and perform as best as I can. And I went out there. Um, yes, I had my best ever result in Olympic Games, but it was far from what I believe I could have achieved. And, but my result, like other many of my, um, I would say the rest of the team, they had a, a lot of negative around it. Um, our country is known for winning medals. Uh, it was the first Olympic Games in a long time we haven't produced a medal. So... As the Olympics went by and, and a lot of top athletes from Trinidad competed and there was no medal, no medal, no medal, the criticism started. Um, and people don't actually understand, first of all, how hard it is to get there. And also, um, for what, whereas our country, our Olympic committees were following the rules of our country, which had lockdowns. Um, some countries, I personally felt like, I knew the guys in Sweden. When I was locked in Spain, they were completely open. When we were locked in Trinidad, people were still open. The Australians at that point in time hadn't even had COVID in their country and the New Zealand guys, they were still sailing restaurants, they had the borders locked. But life was going on and they were training just as hard. Whereas some places like where I was in Spain at one point then, sea access was not allowed. In Trinidad, sea access wasn't allowed. So we had a lot of disadvantages um, to one extent. Um, that's why I was leaving the shores of Trinidad as much as I can um, to be externally in the, in the right venues that would help me. But there was a lot of pressure around it uh, and there was a lot of unnecessary criticism that came with the results around Trinidad and Tobago. I don't believe people really understand the, 
the process, the commitment, the challenge of uh, what an Olympic game requires. Wow. And Andrew, in spite of it all, you're now a three-time Olympian. And you, you wear the red, white, and black. But even in terms of flying the flag, you had the joy, not in the Olympic Games, but the joy of carrying that flag, red, white, and black, and saying, you know, Trinidad and Tobago. And, and what I'm hearing from you is that the Tokyo outlook, we should remain positive for athletes. Because as you said, nobody knows what they have to go through in terms of qualification. And we're going to get there again. The next games are carded for 20. Paris, I see, no, not see, not see, I can't, oh, we, I see we, I see we, oh God, I see, I, you know what I mean? But there's a show where positive moments, we had to learn another language too, sorry, 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 let me just apologize, sorry, 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 sorry. yeah. But um, Andrew, the outlook is still good for 2024, but that's the Olympic qualification, should you choose again? But what's in the future, because I'm sure some doors may have opened, whether they be um, local or international, Andrew, doors are opening all the time and the sponsors will have a confidence with you. I, I say personally, the reason, the, the way you carry yourself and so, you know, you really try to give back to the sponsors, even in helping others. And whether you paid for it or not, I, I've seen you on the ground, we went to a children's home and I've seen you with me on the ground there and we're really giving back and you know what I mean? I said, this is our Olympic athlete and I remember a young guy, I'll never forget that Andrew, we're in the heart of town, I think Nelson Street. And the little young guy look and we you heard your story. Say, Andrew, right, and Mr. Lewis, Mr. Lewis, you know, uh, God save you for a reason. And I was like, Andrew, that little boy, just wow. You know, Andrew, and I, I can imagine you have multiple, even though you shared your story, there are multiple stories like that along the way that money can't buy for, money can't, money can't pay for. Those are things that will remain special to you. And as you continue to journey, Andrew, I mean, Team TTO has a valuable member. But why, where do you see yourself later on? So maybe next Olympics, maybe. Where is Andrew heading to? Um, after each Olympic Games, I normally take a little bit of time off to... Um, you can never get back past time, but have family time um, and to meet with my whole team to make the best decision moving forward. Um, and thankfully, I have the amazing support of my sponsors. Um, so you have many opportunities like... Uh, Continue in the Olympic pathway to Paris. Um, a lot of people are around me say so you have two Olympic games ahead of you, Andrew. Paris and LA. Um, which is, it, I genuinely feel like my body can't do that. Um, but it would be a, a big commitment required because I would like to be better at everything that I do. Uh, I don't want to go to something and do the same thing over and over. Whatever I achieve, it's to uh, excel and, and beat that as much as possible. So if I was to go to, to Paris, I would have to do a bit of a revamp and, and evaluate why is I finished 29 in, in Tokyo. We, that's not happening again. We've got to be in the top 10. Um, but all the different offers are coming to me where big nations around the world are offering me to be coaches, uh, to be their coach. And it's, this is exciting. It reached a place in my life where the value that people see in me um, has become international. And I will carefully consider all options. Um, I'll be forever thankful for the sport of sailing, what it has given me. Uh, forever thankful to my country, especially to wear the red, white, and black. Uh, I, sitting here is an honor, just wearing this. Um, I put it on, and I feel proud every single time, no matter the results I've had, no matter the results of my other um, colleagues or, or other sporting men and women I've had. And I, sailing has, has taken me around the world. Uh, it will continue to take me around the world as long as I stay in it. But the most important thing is, if whatever I am doing, it must have a positive effect on our country and on the world and have the ability to take Andrew Lewis with passion, purpose, and let that be rippled around him as we know the ripple effect. Wow, and as you say the ripple effect, I want to go with the piece. You talk about passion, purpose, and certainly there's a lot of positivity. This is Positive Moments with Andrew and Don. This is, uh, I almost say webinar because you're so accustomed to, but, but uh, episode number 10. But I want to tell you, there's a lot more in store on Positive Moments. We're just beginning. Andrew, I know there's going to be a part three to this story and a part four and a part five. But I just want to say personally, if I can in any way, on behalf of the thousands of people looking on, Andrew, I want to just say, continue to wear that red, white, and black 
and continue to be an inspiration, not only to myself, but to many in this nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And to all the audience looking on, thank you very much for supporting Andrew Lewis. Thank you very much for supporting Positive Moment with Andrew and Don. And just a last message that, you know, you might fall down 10 times, but there is an 11th opportunity. That's what got me to my first Olympic Games. That's what still has me here. And no matter what, I will continue going so that I can grow and glow for the better of myself, my family, my nation, and positive moments with Andrew and Don. We love you lots, and we'll be back again for another episode. See you for number 11. Bye-bye.